Hi, guys. Good morning. Hi, Kyle. How are you all? Good. You? Yeah, I'm well. Pleasure to talk to you both, and uh, especially about such a cool project. Uh, this tribute album, I, I thought it was funny because, you know, in the press release it says finally, and, and, and I think a lot of people have thought that. So I was kind of wondering we, we, where we'll start is how long has this concept been in the making? Seven years and seven months. Seven years and seven months. And two hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're counting. In, in a two, and actually in 2008, I started trying to put together a concert, like Concert for George, which Dan loved, that would be then recorded onto CD. And I was having a terrible time pulling it together. And then I met Norbert. And Norbert said, what if we did a CD first? And then we did the concert after. And um, then we pulled in Irving Azoff, and it the con- it just took off. But it took a very long time, because some of these artists, like the Eagles, were on a world tour. So getting them into their studio to get their tracks done um, just took a little longer than we thought. <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't look like, uh, ultimately, you had any problem getting the artists on board. I mean, this lineup is huge. It is great. We love it. Well, you know, the other thing is all of the artists were very busy at the time. It, 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 as you know, all the profits are going to the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And uh, and so we'd have to wait until they finish touring or they finish their record. And uh, uh, it just takes a while. I, I said to Jean that it would take a year and a half. She'll <laughs> never ask me ever again <laughs> to estimate a time capsule or anything. Okay. But but I think I think it it all happened in good time, didn't it, Gene? Because we got people. If we'd finished early on, we'd have missed a few. We had to let it evolve. And in looking at, at some of these artists, I mean, having uh, Vince and Amy do longer, which you know is a, a, one of the most purest of the love songs ever. Did did they pick that? I mean, because you know, you look at that, and that's one of the biggest hits. And I feel like everybody's going to be fighting for some of the favorites. Did you dole these out, or did you have? Someone like Vince and Amy say, no, that's the one we want to do. We did let them pick, but actually, that's a perfect example of how it evolved because Norbert was stalking Vince Gill. Every time he saw him at an event in Nashville, he'd say, hey, Vince, when are you going to record the song? And Vince would go, soon, soon, but he was really busy. And then finally, um, Norbert ended up talking to someone else, and, and they said, hey, what if we got Vince and Amy to do a duet? And then uh, once Amy was on board, um, they decided on longer, and it just then it happened. But it would have happened differently if Vince had come on board earlier. Now, did you guys give any directions yeah. to the artists uh, about how to do these songs, or was that all just them? No, I, uh, the ones I produced four or five of the tracks early on. But afterwards, as people like Train came on board, uh, Train asked me if I wanted to come to San Francisco and be there, and I said, "No, I want you to do a Train version." You know, I wanted them to put their stamp on it. And uh, and I'm very pleased with the way all of that worked out. Yeah, so are, are are there any? Um, I, I'm sure it's uh, like picking kids, picking favorites, or anything. But I'm so, sort of wondering, like, you get these tracks back. Are there any extra special moments that stand out to either one of you? Most of them stand out to me, uh, especially the ones where they put their stamp on it. Though uh, uh, Gene and I talked about Michael McDonald. Uh, tell him the story about Michael and uh, hearing better change through the through the office door, Irving his office office. <laughs> Yeah, that was probably back in the late 70s, right? He uh, was sitting outside Irving's office and heard the song coming out, wafting out the door, and it was Dan with his guitar playing it for Irving because he was thinking about putting it on the next album, and Michael Mm -hmm. thought, that's a good song, I'd like to record that. So Michael came to us and said, I'd like to record Better Change, and and Norbert and I both had to go look it up because we didn't know what song it was, one of Dan's lesser-known songs. Yes, and it now is. it's one of my favorites on the record. Yes. Well, and, and that's, that, that's sort of the other side of the, the coin here. It's like, you know, when you when you get these songs, and you're both so close to so many of these songs, uh, when, when the artists put their own stamp and reinterpret, it sort of gives you that chance to hear them, you know, in a different way. And I, I don't know, there are, are there any moments where you're like, you know, I've never realized this song, you know, had that or is about that or something? Like, did you ever have those moments with these covers? Well, same old Lang Syne, um, Train... <laughs> It's it, you can dance to it, and and it's amazing and it's wonderful. I, that's probably for me the the most surprising version, and um, we we both love it. So it's a dance to. It's not something you always associate with uh, with Ann Fogelberg music. No, right? and yet they stayed very true to it. I, I say yeah, I'm and calling. Young Casey James did the Raven with uh, <laughs> with a Stevie Ray Vaughan guitar solo that he played. You know, he's a Texas boy. Yeah. And I thought he really put a stamp on Raven. But uh, Zach Brown coming out and doing Leader of the Bad, 
And Gene, we have video on that, don't we? Yeah. From the Red yeah. Rocks. We're live at Red Rocks. And Dobie Gray, who who did Don't Lose Heart. I mean, uh, Dan had actually talked to me about going back into the studio at some point and, and doing Don't Lose Heart with a little more of a gospel feel, and that's exactly what Dobie did. Great. It's a great track. Something that was just, like, naturally there that needed to come out of that song. That I guess it. so. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I, I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky, so we're definitely very close to Run for the Roses. I was really happy to see that on there. I mean, it's, you know, one that we hear every single year around May, every single time with, without fail. And, uh, and to have the Nitty Gritty guys doing that, I mean, that's, for me, such a special moment on this yeah. record. And, and I guess beyond this, I mean, there's a musical, right? Part of the plan? Does that, is that what you guys, are you a part of that, or is that just something that's out there happening in the world? Uh, no, Kate Atkinson and Karen Harris are the two women that did the story behind it, and um, it premiered in Nashville, and it was amazing and uh, got great reviews, and now they're trying to get it onto Broadway. Uh, it's not Dan's story. It's a beautiful story, but it just uses um, Dan's music. That's so cool. And, and Gene, I, I did read that there was a, uh, there's a song called Sometimes a Song that's, that was written about you. I'm, I'm guessing that was hands-off for this album. We didn't have any hands off, but um, most of these people probably weren't familiar with it. Um, there was um, in the last years there was a time when I was here finishing our house in Maine, and Dan was in Colorado, and it was Valentine's Day, and we weren't going to be together. So he wrote that for me, um, and then on Valentine's Day, um, FedEx arrived with the uh, with the CD, it was kind of like a Valentine card for me. The song was. This is a really, really, really cool project, and again, having this kind of star power on board just goes to show the strength of uh, of Dan's music. So, you know, good job on you all. Congratulations, and thank you for sharing it with the world. Thank you, Kyle. Right. Take care, y'all. Bye. Bye.